this is Arlene. Hi, welcome to Anything Can Happen Friday. <laughs> You're so excited, Grace. Yes. And of course, uh, today we'll be talking about something that is not uh, a recent trend, but is something that is, I would say, it's, it's an ancient art, not just an exercise. Yeah, but then a lot of people, especially females, they have been practicing this, and then it sort of became a culture, especially in Asian countries. And I see more of uh, institutions are established uh, around this area. Of course, we are talking about yoga, which is uh, now become a global craze, mm-hmm. uh, and and it's it's a very healthy and very relaxing way of exercising, but it's it's also very spiritual in a way it and is. because of that we have a guest here to share with us on uh, yoga as well as to commemorate the international yoga day and then his name is mohan raj uh, gurubatham he's a um uh, uh, director and as well as the uh, uh from the corporation communication so hi welcome yeah so uh, i just introduce myself again i'm actually a senior professor at a university in malaysia uh, and um, I am right now in the United States. It's 8 p.m. Central Time. I hope I'm loud and clear. You are and, very clear. <laughs> and right, so mm-hmm. go ahead. Go yeah. ahead. Uh, yeah, I think the first question is, why yoga? <laughs> why yoga is now becoming something that is a global phenomenon? A very good question. Uh, yoga, as you mentioned, I heard in your little discussion there, uh, is several thousand years old. And um, and it kicked off in India by a sage called Patanjali, uh, P-A-T-N-J-L-Y-I, who had 45. And these sages are seers or rishis. Uh, uh, just like in China, they had these seafoods. Uh, a, a rishi actually cognizes the impulses of natural law. But Patanjali... Uh, was the first codified. It, it wasn't just something that he passed on orally, but he actually codified it. So that was around 200 to 400 uh, common era. Now, fast forward 2,000 years to 2015, um, the trend of yoga, as you as you have observed correctly, has been increasing with momentum. It has become a rage, uh, a fad in some senses, a trend. And in some respects, even driver. A driver is something which is now institutionalized. So it is both a trend and a driver. Let's take the trend of it. Uh, it is very, very uh, common to go to any major city in the world and you find yoga studios. Now, let's understand what yoga is. And if I'm going too fast, you can always ask me to slow down and I'll be happy to do that. Yeah, sure. Am I going to- <laughs> oh, this is very pleasant to hear. <laughs> okay, cool. So yoga, it comes from, it's a Sanskrit word, which means u- union or unite. So it, uni- it actually unifies the mind and body. So we can be a little more scientific, or just take a tad more inspection into what mind and body means. Now, I'm, I'm a psychologist. I'm a professor of psychology and global management. Right. So mind for me basically means the, uh, the container of knowledge, our attention system, how we cognize, how we interpret uh, signals, signs, our senses, how we organize this into information and knowledge. Yeah, but the, the mind also needs a physiological substrate, then the body, the nervous system. So yoga actually unites or unifies the mind and body with a goal of perfecting this coordination of mind and body, mm-hmm. right? And so it has become a major trend uh, for people to just want to develop their mind and body, never mind the spiritual aspect. But, but uh, why, why developing uh, a unity between the mind and body is important? And why it is lacking now in today's modern society? That's a very good question. So when we, the, the importance of unifying the mind and body is simply because we realize that there is wholeness in nature. And we are part of nature, and our mind and body are the first most direct, most intimate level of our experience of nature. And the mind at its deeper level, I remember in a radio show last year, Eileen, I talked of transcendental consciousness, restful alertness, which is going beyond the mind to the source of thinking, which is pure consciousness, which in fact is the goal of yoga. So yoga's importance in unifying the mind and body is to restore normalcy, right? 
so we heal ourselves. So, um, and unity in the world is actually very much desired. I, I find it rather amusing to try and justify the need for unity because there's so much conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, if just, you know, we are part of nature, we are part of a family, our own family, we are part of a community, we are also part of an ecosystem on the planet. That means everything is connected and interconnected. So, you know, no one or no nation or no community should be marginalized, alienated. We are all part of this wholeness. So yoga's goal really is the wholeness of creation, uh, looking at uh, unity in terms of diversity. And, and unity is not uniformity or sameness. Unity means thriving differences, respect and appreciation, in fact, love for the differences and a higher order unification. In fact, this was the articulation of India's prime minister, and this is now a bit going from a trend to a driver. A prime minister Modi, when he became the prime minister in India last year, and his message was to the United Nations General Assembly uh, in September last year, I believe. He said that yoga is really from India's tradition of Vasudeva Kutumbatam, a Sanskrit phrase which simply means the world is my family. And he said yoga is a gift of India's ancient tradition, but nonetheless it is actually universal in terms of its impact and application. It doesn't matter uh, what culture or religion, whether you are traditional or modern, or from whatever walk of life. So he has gone further to actually offer uh, free yoga classes in India for their civil service. So coming back to your point about unity of mind and body, Prime Minister Modi says, Yoga embodies the unity of mind and body, thought and action, restraint and fulfillment, harmony between man and nature. It is a holistic approach to health and well-being. It is not about exercise as what the fads and trends seem to just suggest, but to discover the sense of oneness with yourself, the world and nature. Right, and so about 177 countries signed on for Yoga Day, including China. Uh, they had a big a massive event in Delhi in India and also in the University of Peking in Beijing and all over uh, the world. And in fact, in, in, in Times Square in New York, they had a big celebration and the Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, in other words, the Chief, uh, Ban Ki-moon, who's from South Korea, also mm -hmm. kind of echoed the words of uh, Prime Minister Modi. Uh, I shall pause here in case you have any questions. Yeah. Yes, I do. In fact, <laughs> well, that is uh, quite a but in, inside also depth when it comes to yoga. It's, it it looks like and it sounds like and it perhaps it is true that it is more than a sport. It embraces all aspects of life itself. And but my question here is, what actually triggered? this yoga to perhaps to become a culture of other nations, uh, such as other parts of the Asian countries or perhaps the Western? Yeah, I think uh, from various uh, uh, sages from India, uh, they traveled to the West and there have been yogis and the most famous in, in our modern time, mm -hmm. uh, as I'm not that old, and from the last latter part of the last century and in the 21st century is Maharishi Mahesh Yogi the founder of the Transcendental Meditation Technique and Movement. And he was one of those people who, who actually encouraged a lot of scientific research uh, into yoga, uh, which has a component of meditation of dhyana, which is part and parcel of yoga, Transcendental Meditation. And in the United States, the conservative federal agency, the National Institute of Health, uh, has invested over 25 million U.S. dollars into wow into Transcendental Meditation, which is part and parcel of yoga, as cardiovascular therapy, uh, not in terms of just uh, curing, but also in terms of prevention of heart disease. And mm. the studies have been going on for over 10 years, well documented, published in major journals, and uh, first initially targeting African Americans at risk, people who are under severe stress in inner city areas. Right. So that is a major trigger or driver. Uh, in Southeast Asia, yoga has been traditionally kind of trickled into Indonesia. And there's another sage called Augustia, who has legend has it that he lived in India and Indonesia. It's part of, Indonesians know this very well, it's part of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata and the tradition. 
And at you know, various points, it may kind of devolve into exercise. But now I think the restoration of the knowledge of it being very powerful in terms of mind-body coordination and the transcendental meditation aspect has triggered a lot of research, over right. 600 studies. 600 have been published in mainline journals. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, the more interesting part is in terms of unity and diversity, which is a message of a yoga. Uh, and, and 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 very fond. It was. It is actually the ancient motto of India, uh, where the whole world is one big family, respecting the differences. You know, it, unity does not mean you and I must be the same. Uh, yeah, it's not we, about we always confuse. You know, I always confuse with the two word unity and sameness. What's but what's the no, difference? That, that is that is not understanding that nature is diverse and nature evolves. It's progressive. So diversification, differentiation. Is part and parcel of the, me- of the mechanics of evolution. I mean, if you walk into a garden, you want to enjoy the diversity of flowers. You know, we can't say one flower is the most beautiful and we must make all flowers like this. I mean, what is the point of us being here? That's true. You know, we tell the differences, you know. The, the differences create a higher order unification. So it's not unity. It's not sameness. Now, so... That is basically the goal of yoga, and there has been research which is powerful in the theme of uh, unity. Uh, it can lead to conflict resolution. I did part of this research myself when I was a graduate student in England a long time ago when I was studying uh, the new media. I looked at the British media covering conflict in the Balkans, and I had one group actually doing this practice of yogic flying, uh, uh, advanced transcendental meditation in Eastern Europe. The prediction was when a small number of these people actually uh, practice this advanced technique of Patanjali, of yogic flying, the body hops, uh, they will have a soothing effect on the environment, and you can measure the results. So the major landmark study was published in the Journal of uh, Conflict Resolution, a very conservative journal put out by Yale University. The study was funded by Harvard and AT&T, the American Telco. It looked at the conflict in Lebanon, in the Middle East. Uh, uh, in the 80s, and they found the statistically very significant results using a time series methodology where you had a small group in, in Jerusalem and the coding was done in, in Egypt, in, in Cairo, and people were blind to the, uh, to the data, so that means there's no bias, and you make a priori, that means beforehand predictions on when you can see a cessation of violence or fatalities or, or reduction, which can be measured with hard data uh, uh, in terms of fighting or battles. And so this was published in the Journal of Conflict Resolution, and the editors were blown away. They said that, you know, the methodology is impeccable in terms of the science of it, mm-hmm. but the theory is something that is very uh, unusual because uh, classical physics, if you look at uh, Isaac Newton's physics, which is something we respect, it has given us many good things in our life, yep. we cannot explain how people meditating and doing this advanced yogic flying technique in one part of the world can have an effect. And it's a small group which has an effect on the majority of the diversity and incoherence. How does the small group practicing yogic flying bring about uh, a major shift in consciousness where people become more positive? Time and space seem to be collapsed in one's own awareness and, uh, and consciousness. So okay. some physics. Very, very interesting, uh, Dr. Mohan. But we'll take one short break and we will continue with uh, the discussion on how it affects, you know, yoga affects society as well as science. Anything can happen Friday. The art and cultural side of Southeast Asia. Hey, this is Arlene. Welcome back. This is Grace. And of course, you are still with us on our topics regarding on yoga. Also to commemorate the International Yoga Day uh, on last week, actually 21st of June. Um, so, our guest today, Dr. Mohan, he has a lot to talk about. But uh, when you were talking uh, about, you were touching on the topic on science, I'm curious to know because there are people who actually dismiss uh, yoga and other forms of meditation or spirituality uh, approach uh, as part of science or hard sciences. Do you agree with that? Uh, they, usually they would say that it's pseudoscience. Uh, I think the skepticism is always welcome. In fact, science actually progresses because uh, people do not try to prove anything, and the methodology of science 
uh, the so-called Popperian tradition of Karl Popper uh, in the Western scientific tradition is to attempt to disprove a, a theory uh, with a hypothesis. We have a null hypothesis. So we don't try to prove anything. What we try to do is set up controls, uh, conditions, try to explain other factors to see if chance plays a, 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 a role. And if we can rule out chance by probability of chance being a very small agent, let's say one out of a thousand, that means, you know, it's less than, it's, a, it's less equal to or less than uh, one point zero zero one. Right. That means one percent or one percent. Uh, that means if chance is only one percent or one percent, that means it's a very low probability that mm -hmm. chance cannot exist. And so then we have to rule out chance as a factor in the uh, uh, intervention. In this, in this case, if I uh, do transcendental meditation and I practice yoga, I actually find improvements in my health. I find improvements in my intelligence. Uh, and I find this across groups. Uh, experiments have been done in America where they have school students, even school teachers who are under stress. And they measure longitudinally. This is not a flaky one-off effect in San Francisco, in, uh, in, in Chicago. Uh, they call them cool schools. They have quiet time. And they find that students are less stressed, grades improve, teachers are less stressed. And you can measure this. Wow. You can measure this in terms of EEG, brain wave coherence. We talked about this before. Uh, in some cases, in the case of cardiovascular illness, they right. looked at the uh, heart rate. Uh, they looked at uh, the blood chemistry. Uh, they look at plaque, uh, which is actually deposited in the system, which can cause heart disease. Uh, so there are many variables. And so we always try to set up the experimental condition such that chance is not the factor. We're not trying to prove. So the, the whole methodology is driven by a healthy skepticism. And, and more often than not, the, the research is done by independent people, people who are not, who don't believe in this in independent universities. Mm -hmm. I hope that kind of gives you some insight into your question. Well, uh, it does uh, yoga itself uh, with the scientific oldest uh, proof that it has a lot of benefits uh, in every area of life. And also we cannot ignore and also to notice that yoga has different, a lot of different types. And then, um, well, personally, I used to attend yoga classes before, but then when it comes to choosing yoga, there were various types, not only does the traditional yoga, but it also has the sort of modernized and it, it it has a lot of infusion with the different elements. So perhaps could you elaborate more on that? Yeah. Um, first of all, there is there are several types of yoga, as you have, may have discovered. Uh, the physical yoga is called Hatha Yoga, which mm -hmm. is where they do what's called asana, the yoga postures, which of course has become very popular and people associate yoga with these sometimes unwieldy positions. And that is, you know, you have yoga studios in KL and DJ uh -huh. and all over America. And all over the world, as a matter of fact, that is Hatha Yoga. Okay. Uh, and then we also have uh, Jnana Yoga, which is basically yoga of the intellect. And then the spiritual aspects of yoga, which is Bhakti, which is more from the feeling of devotion. Now, there are many other aspects, and um, but nonetheless, all of these aspects lead to yoga, unity. And it's very hard to judge, you know, uh, who is doing what for what, because it's very subjective. Uh, a person who is very physically inclined as an athlete uh, may transcend and experience unity very quickly uh, versus someone who's reading a lot because their minds can be stuck on concepts and they cannot transcend, which right. means to go beyond being stuck. So yoga's goal is to become unstuck uh, so that you unfreeze from the boundaries in mind and body and even within the mind. Now, transcendental meditation is part and parcel of yoga, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, the founder of Transcendental Meditation, kind of cleaned up the misunderstanding and he became very popular in the West. He encouraged a lot of research and, and he said that yoga is part and parcel. I'm sorry, Transcendental Meditation is part and parcel of yoga. He said Patanjali's eight steps of yoga where you must do one thing after another. Like, for example, first you must do the yoga asanas followed by uh, 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 meditation and so on to achieve unity. He says that has been misunderstood. It's not steps, but limbs. Right. And the analogy he gave was, I pull one leg of the table through transcendental meditation, I transcend, 
the other three legs come along because they're all connected. And this really is the underlying uh, insight of yoga, which is basically everything is connected. Mind and body is connected. The intellect and emotions are connected. Heart and brain are connected. Uh, we amongst ourselves are connected. We doesn't even matter the distance. You know, I'm here in, in the United States in the Midwest and you're in Pataling Jaya, I believe in Taman Mega. Correct. Where <laughs> That's right. Uh, and how are we communicating with each other through Wi-Fi? I'm on a Wi-Fi on my tablet, right? Yeah. Wi-Fi is use of the electromagnetic spectrum. Everything is connected. So the human physiology, the nervous system, is also uh, receiving and transmitting. So whether we know it or not, we're all connected in a field of consciousness. This we call unified field. Modern physics, some of the modern physicists have glimpsed that everything is connected in nature. So now science is saying, let's test it and see if people doing something in one part of the world to this simple act of <coughs> yoga called transcendental meditation, can they have an effect on the environment? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so they've studied this in America where he had the Maharishi effect. Yep. So he predicted this several years ago. He said when a small group, 1% doing this, it, they have an effect on the 99%. It's like the Meissner effect in magnetism. 1% of the electrons will neutralize the incoherence of the rest of the magnetic field. So 1% has a coherent creating effect or a coherence creating effect on the rest. And so we don't make value judgments of what is right or wrong. We find everything becomes more and more orderly. Because when people say you are wrong and I'm right, and everybody starts getting into an argument. True. So there must be, uh, you know, and it's also subjective. But nonetheless, there is some indications of what everybody shares, what everybody likes, right? We all prefer peace. We all prefer friendliness. We all prefer liking, enjoying. Uh, we all prefer not having disease and suffering kind of thing. So when 1% are doing this technique of transcendental meditation, they found this in 17 studies in the U.S., in the Midwest, uh, matched against control groups by demographic data. Uh, they found after one year, crime rate fell uh, significantly, and it got published, and this phenomenon has been published 30 times. Now, coming back to this more advanced technique of yogic flying, uh, where people practice the superior mind-body coordination, it's a square root of 1%. Uh, so for Malaysia, for example, with a population of uh, 30 million, I believe, uh, we need about five to 600 people practicing this advanced technique of hopping, but predicted by Patanjali. And we find we can actually measure these effects if you want to. Uh, uh, we find there's a significant reduction in crime. Uh, the, can, everything stabilizes and normalizes. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and replicate 30 times. So this is the goal of yoga. It's unity not just in terms of the individual's intimate experience of oneness uh, with his mind and body, or her mind and body and self, the deep self, not the ego, uh, but also the individual and the environment. Mm -hmm. Everything so it affects the psychology of the person as well. Yeah, mind is psychology, software and hardware is body. Both are intimately connected. My, meaning, can... meaning the emotion of the person. Let's say a person well, is, uh, you know, un... un unstable in terms of its motion. Do you think you can have a more neutral emotion exactly. by practicing yoga? Uh, not neutral in terms of dulling the person. The emotions become enlivened in their full range. That means mm -hmm. I enjoy, I enjoy, uh, let's say, the opera more. I enjoy uh, uh, K-pop more. I enjoy uh, classical music more. Mm -hmm. I enjoy tennis more. The emotions are full in full value. So they expand. The awareness yeah. towards your, your surrounding and yourself become and much more... It is, it is actually balanced with the full development of mind. Mm -hmm. Remember, in some, it's not just emotions. Mm -hmm. It's also thinking. It's cognition. So thinking and feeling. Mm -hmm. Emotions are feeling. Uh, thinking is the mind. Both feeling and thinking become balanced, not mm -hmm. diminished. You understand? Mm -hmm. And the doesn't become dull. It becomes lively. I mean, peace is 
that it's not uh, dull. It's vibrant alertness. Right. Yes. That that will also lead to have a sort of self-control mechanism as well, isn't it? I mean, developing yeah. uh, yourself, restraining yourself. For example, smoking. So by practicing yoga, I mean psychologically, you can also self-control to 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 extend yourself. That perhaps uh, you know I can control myself, uh, staying away from you know smoking or any sort of the addict addiction that you have been to. Yeah. That's a very good question. It's a very important question because a lot of money uh, is being spent in terms of rehabilitation, and now we're looking at health as being more preventative. Uh, now, the interesting word there is control and restraint. Now, I'm going to put on the table something quite different. I'm going to simply say uh, when you practice transcendental meditation, which is yoga, it is not so much restraint that is controlling oneself. You find the desire for substance abuse right. comes with stress. So the more stressed you are, the more uh, inclined you are to substance abuse, whether it's a lot of caffeine or sugary stuff or smoking, and in extreme cases, recreational drugs, which can be quite dangerous. Yep. So we find that as we restore the mind-body connection through meditation and yoga, uh, the need for the substance abuse begins to fall out very naturally. It is not based on force or restraint. Right. So that's, I think, something important to understand, right? So it's naturalness, all right? It's not so much control. Right. Of course. And then also, we need to distinguish between or discern between, it's a very subtle point, discern between inhibition and a moral judgment based on higher intelligence and wisdom. Mm. When we meditate, we find as the stresses in our system become dissolved, we become less inhibited. We become more creative. The inhibition that leads to to actually expressing ourselves properly, expressing ourselves, uh, what is unique about us, our creativity, our, our critical thinking, for example, sometimes are inhibited by the stresses in our physiology, the blockages in our own body, right. or in terms of the environment. Now, when we meditate, we release these stresses, so the full potential of the individual is released. At the same time, the wisdom also develops. So it's not based on inhibition or restraint, but it's based on the development of intelligence and higher intelligence, meaning wisdom, where we make wise judgments. We don't want to offend people. We realize that we have a right to speak, but our friends are also important, and they are different. We respect our differences, and we don't offend. So the feeling is also very tender. So meditation through transcendental meditation, as a lot of research shows, that interpersonal relations improve, uh, not just the field effect, tend to appreciate the diversity. You know, there's a saying, you know, everything in nature's garden is beautiful. You know, uh, I appreciate everything innocently. And, and so I, as I appreciate, I also show my appreciation. Mm -hmm. And... So that's why, you know, we have the culmination in terms of unity and diversity. Again, unity is not uniformity. Mm -hmm. uh, if, that's, that, if that is nature, or if you believe in a creator, why should there be differences? Why are we all different? No, it's yeah. because we are meant to change, to evolve. Yeah, you know, totally agree with that. Totally agree right. with that. Uh, but anyway, we'll take another one short break. When we return, we will have more discussion with Dr. Mohan. <laughs> Anything can happen Friday. The art and cultural site of Southeast Asia. Hey, this is Arlene. Hi, welcome back. This is Grace. And of course, you are still with us on our Anything Can Happen Friday. Of yes. course, what is happening today is we discussing on the topic regarding about yoga. And they we're still uh, speaking to uh, Dr. Mohan, or, and he's uh, now in the USA, and they we're uh, via uh, Skype to interview him. And we have been talking quite insightful, uh, um, the facts and also his experiences uh, uh, from uh, practicing yoga. Perhaps we can go more in depth. <laughs> yes, but... But you know, I have I have a personal question, like right. a, like a cheeky personal question. <laughs> Is there a yoga for losing weight <laughs> as <Yeah>. a woman? <laughs> okay, can I answer? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think the the hatha yoga is helpful in uh, in in blissfully uh, being slim. It's not about forcing and 
uh, straining yourself uh, to be thin, you know, mm -hmm. those same yeah. conditions. So yoga, I remember, is about balance. So you find your natural uh, level of your physiology in terms of what it needs to be. And when you practice transcendental meditation, it shows that stress is released. Now, some research in the last 10 years seems to suggest that as people are stressed or even sleep less, they tend to put on weight. Yes. Uh, so now, if we identify that as a major contributor to stress, lack of sleep, sleep deprivation, or and that leads to uh, becoming obese, or not even obese perhaps, but becoming uh, putting on weight, that's putting it more politically correctly, um, you find that the cause again or it is exacerbate, or the cause or the agency that exacerbates uh, putting on weight is stress. So we release the stress through yoga or transcendental meditation, mm -hmm. which has found to be, through the research, the most effective uh, antidote to stress. It immunizes the nervous system against stress. And for most of us, it actually releases the stress through a level of deep rest. So finding the balance through yoga, through meditation, uh, does achieve uh, an ideal level of the body type, right? Yeah. Uh, with having to force oneself into a strenuous regime, which is very artificial, which in and of itself can create stress. And so you're not actually solving the problem. You're adding another layer of stress into, into, your, into your life and into your body. Mm -hmm. uh, do you understand the point? Yeah, it's very fascinating. <laughs> well, it doesn't only touch on the uh, losing weight, but then it comes with a lot of health benefits. That's true. And then it is very interesting that how it affects the whole, it can affect the whole society, the working environment and psychologically uh, to to make sure that you're, you know, you think and you understand the situation first before you put in an action. Yes, absolutely. Uh it's always, we begin with ourselves. You know, change comes from ourselves. So, you know, be the change you want to be in the world is what uh, Gandhi said. Now, interestingly, the United Nations declared June 21st the longest day. It is Prime Minister Modi, which is the, which is the summer solstice, actually, in the Northern Hemisphere, the, the longest day, to be Yoga Day in 177 countries. And the... The goal of yoga is unification. It starts with the self. And it was Gandhi who said, be the change that you want to see in the world. Yep. And, and this change must come in a very natural, friendly to oneself way. Because if we add more stress in trying to change ourselves, we create stress in the environment. Now, we all have very good goals, uh, sincere goals, but we take care of ourselves. Now, one of the... Uh, in, in the United Nations, in the history of the United Nations, they had, because since this, is the, this was the United Nations International Yoga Day, yep. Vijaya Lakshmi Pandit was the first, I think, ambassador of India to the United Nations. And he said that uh, wars start in the minds of men. So when we find peace in, us, in ourselves, in our minds, and we find in our hearts the unity amongst all ourselves, and we understand that diversity is necessary and indeed to be enjoyed, then, you know, peace begins with yourself. And if the individual is the unit of world peace, the logic is actually very compelling. We don't try to force change on people. We start with ourselves. And even so, we don't need everybody. Just a small group can have a powerful effect, minding their own business, meditating and doing yoga. Mm. To transcendentalization. Wow. So begin with yourself. Now, this message is also for doctors and nurses who are very stressed, teachers. Uh, so we say we heal ourselves first. You know, we have responsibilities in the world. Uh, we embrace the diversity and the challenge. We don't run away. Mm -hmm. Life is here to be enjoyed, as mm -hmm. Maharishi said. So we enjoy the diversity. Unification basically is bringing the unity at a higher level, which allows change to occur, mm -hmm. which does not impose a common standard, you know, one size fits all on the diversity, which is already a source of conflict in the world. I know my my ex is better than yours, my philosophy, my religion, my culture, my my political system, you know, it's causing a lot of conflict in the world. Yes. You know, each 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 part of the world is part of an ecosystem. Whether they're traditional peoples in the forest in East Malaysia, you know, they are 
silently enlivening natural laws in the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's someone working in uh, uh, in the Klang Valley, busy, right, uh, in in uh, as a teacher or as a doctor, right, or as a housewife, they're taking care of the environment. So in the, we're all part of this texture, this web, right? Yep. We give and take. And there's intelligence. And there is basically yoga brings us dharma, which means natural order. So we respect that. And this is really what we call deep sustainability. I'll be in a conference tomorrow about deep sustainability. Mm -hmm. So deep sustainability mm -hmm. is about something that lasts. It's not a fashion or a fad. Uh, it's not greenwashing, as we say. It's not PR. It's something that understands that how we are all connected. And we, we understand this through the deep insights when we transcend through transcendental meditation. And we know the interconnections between in our own mind and body, but also between ourselves and the environment. And these are the laws of nature. And we're just beginning to discover them. Science, to its credit, discovered them and codified a methodology in trying to understand. And, and science has given us a lot of good things, right? Yep. So now we are on the level in the 21st century to understand the spiritual and the yogic connections to show how this natural law is expressed uh, in the diversity and how it unites this diversity. And it begins with ourselves. Well, perhaps to our listeners and also youngsters, uh, who, uh, they been going through very busy uh, schedule, perhaps going to the schools and after they have so many activities after all. Uh, any recommendations that um, uh, Dr. Mohan, you can give to them uh, to practice at least a bit of yoga or a taste of yoga? Yeah, I would recommend them to contact the uh, Transcendental Education Center. Uh, it is, uh, the number is, I'm just trying to pull it out. Um, it is I'll give you the address first. The address sure. is number 22, Jalan 17, Stoke 1, Pataling Jaya. The number is um, basically, I think I sent it to you. Let me try to dig it out. Um, hang on a minute. Uh, I think the number is the 03795 and 88109. That is correct. Can you yeah. say that loud? So uh, you, again, I will repeat uh, 03795 and then the address is at number 22, Jalan 17 uh, 1, Pataling Jaya. Yeah. yeah, can you put it on your website, please? Because they had a celebration in this uh, Transcendental Meditation Maharishi Invincibility Center on Yoga Day. Right. Uh, and they would welcome students who are busy, executives, housewives, anyone who's busy. It doesn't matter who you are, what ever walk of life, mm -hmm. uh, please give them a call at that number, if you can say that number again, Grace, and put okay. it on your website. Uh, Ken Tiong is the national director, and there are many teachers who will give a free lecture on how to learn this. In five days or so, you will learn. And and we teach, you know, a lot of people, six million people have learned this. There are, uh, you know, thousands have learned in South Africa, and uh, I've been involved in the research there. And, you know, thousands of students in America, you know, from San Francisco to Chicago to other schools now, it is transforming America. And I think if you go to my Facebook page on dates, and I think, yeah. Aline, you've been there, yeah. you can see it. Huffington Post practices Transcendental Meditation, Ariana Huffington, the editor. And they carry a lot of articles. And, and it's just coming in every day. Right. So it's for people who are busy. We emphasize that it's stress management, but it's more than that. It's actually... But we need to understand stress, and so we need to treat stress, and it's, you can inoculate against stress. But the goal is unity. That is yoga. So transcendental meditation on dhyana uh, restores the connection in all parts of yoga. Mind is very powerful. So we use the mind or the thinking process to transcend. Transcend means to go beyond. So we use thinking to go beyond thinking to experience the innermost self, which is not, you know, you... Grace or Aline or Mimo Han, but something which is the universal self in all of us. Right. It's self consciousness. It's restful alertness. That's the operational definition. And that is the first major milestone in the unity of mind, body, uh, in the experience of self in terms of yoga. The next is the field effect. There's an extended effect. We all are part of this field of intelligence. And some physicists call this a unified field. Mm -hmm. 
Einstein yeah. was languishing after this for most of his life. He couldn't prove it. Uh, but somehow most cultures intuitively understand everything is connected. Uh, we're all part of nature. There is intelligence in nature. Yep. And you know what? Some people, will, as, even as children, we suspect, I feel I'm part of this and this is also part of me. Somehow uh -huh. yes. we, are, we are understanding without speaking. Uh, deep intelligence. As we become sophisticated as adults, we lose the sensitivity. Surprise, surprise, no, it hasn't gone. It's there st inside you still, and you can read it. So it's not about religion. It's mm. not about politics, though we respect all that. This is something which is very intimate and experiential, plus scientifically verifiable. And all kinds of skeptical questions are perfectly welcome. <laughs> So that is part of evolution, you know, to discriminate, to understand the differences. So please call the Maharshi Invincibility Center at Bataling Jaya. Uh, it is uh, the number again, Grace. I can't find it here. Well, um, I will look for the, uh, the more information. And we will post it on our Facebook yes, for, for the sure. links as well. And yeah. uh, more information about yoga. If people want to search more about you know, be the benefits of yoga, the types of yoga, or even about you, since you're also lecturing, how can they uh, search for it? Me on Facebook. Uh, you have my Facebook links, and I can ha be happy to add them. You can put my Facebook link. Of course, I will uh, have to see who is asking what, because you know <laughs> what's happening these days, right? And so, and there's also a Facebook link for International Yoga Day, which I sent to you, Grace, I think. Yes, you have. Uh, uh, post the, can you post those links, International Yoga Day? Uh, it actually, and then, uh, and also my dates for learning Transcendental Meditation, and we also carry links on yoga. Uh, I can give you permission to post those two links on your banner if you want. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, last question before we end the show. Uh, I want to know about why yoga uh, is something that is unchanging, that is modern, that that people should always practice it in their daily lives, if there's one reason for it. Because, you know, there are people who would be, you know, either too lazy for doing it or thinking it's for those who have the perfect body posture. <laughs> um, but, but why do you think uh, people, especially Malaysia and Southeast Asia, we are one of the fattest okay. people in the world? <laughs> yeah, obesity is increasing. I think... Yeah. I think I'm just going to say it very in a very sort of um, uh, modern way, in context. We give our time and attention and energy in our day to a lot of people. We work 12 to 18 hours sometimes. Some people are working. And by the time they come home, it's sleep time. So why don't you give yourself this time of, you know, 20 minutes of meditating or maybe 10 minutes of yoga asanas, you know? Uh, so half an hour each day, twice a day uh, for yourself so that you appreciate yourself more, you improve your health, you increase your intelligence, you can give more, plus you like yourself a lot more. <laughs> I uh, mean, medi meditating doesn't mean that you need to light up the candles and <laughs> dim the light and then put on okay, some music. <laughs> quietly, that you don't even have to do the yoga asana because meditation, <laughs> transcendation, is in and of itself yoga, as I said earlier. It's part and parcel of yoga. So we don't have to associate the bodily postures. You don't have to light a candle, as you say. We don't have to wear special clothes or chant any names or listen to music. No. People do it on a train. Uh, people do it on a plane. I do it sometimes in a bus, sometimes, sometimes in, a, in, in the airport lounges as I travel. Uh, it's done quietly, sitting comfortably, 15 to 20 minutes morning in a day, mm -hmm. twice a day. No change in lifestyle or diet. The lifestyle... Diet changes come naturally. We don't change for the sake of changing. We, mm -hmm. it, the change comes spontaneously. The key word is spontaneous. That means very natural. Right. So, awesome. You understand? Yes. That your body will instinctively know what is right for it. If you still enjoy McDonald's, fine. You know, if you, <laughs> you still you want, you know, uh, organic vegetarian food, it'll come naturally to you. Mm. We don't judge. If you want to learn yoga and meditation for selfish reasons because you want to do better in the stock market, absolutely fine. Because, you know, you, you become sharper. And many, many brokers in Wall Street are doing this, mm -hmm. you know. 
one of the most famous uh, uh, brokers, you know, um, it's a Huffington Post. I can't mention their names without their permission. But so uh, politicians are doing it. Prime Minister Modi also practices transcendental meditation. So it's uh, up so to us the, now <laughs> to practice it, <laughs> to show example the, of the, yoga. The president of Brazil, you know, mm-hmm. uh, she's a lady and she's promoting it, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, yes, it's up to you. But, you know, it's a choice we all make. Yeah, sure, uh, that's true. It's on persuasion or, 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 or propaganda or forcing. It's something that you decide as a self-improvement approach. I want to spend, I want to do yoga and meditation to improve myself. I want to give myself this time. Yeah. And it must be easy to do, not difficult, no mm-hmm. change in life. Yeah. And definitely so. But uh, we are towards the end of our show. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohan, for sharing the beauty and you know the richness of yoga. And definitely, we both will be trying it very, very soon. Yes. And, so, and, and thank you very much. Good night from, from where I am. Yes. And, uh, it's still the, good morning uh, here. <laughs> you can post the Transcendental Meditation Yoga Center in Pataling Jaya and the phone number. And the links to the uh, International Yoga Day mm-hmm. on your banner, uh, I think that will facilitate. Also, my dates for learning Transcendental Meditation, mm-hmm. you have the links. Yep. Uh, that will facilitate. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you.